Chapter Twenty of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was about a week from the beginning of Lent when there would be a lull in the city's gaieties, and society would shift the scene of its activities to the country clubs and to California and hot springs in Palm Beach. Mrs. Caroline Smith invited Alice to join her in an expedition to the last named place, but Montague interposed, because he saw that Alice had been made pale and nervous by three months of night and day festivities. Also, a trip to Florida would necessitate ten or fifteen thousand dollars worth of new clothes, and these would not do for the summer, it appeared. They would be faded and passé by that time. So Alice settled back to rest, but she was too popular to be let alone. A few days later came another invitation, this time from General Prentice and his family. They were planning a railroad trip to be gone for a month, and they would have a private train and twenty-five people in the party, and would take in California and Mexico, swinging round the circle, as it was called. Alice was wild to go and Montague gave his consent. Afterward he learned, to his dismay, that Charlie Carter was one of those invited, and he would have liked to have Alice withdraw, but she did not wish to, and he could not make up his mind to insist. These train trips were the very latest diversion of the well-to-do. A year ago no one had heard of them, and now fifty parties were leaving New York every month. You might see a dozen of such hotel trains at once at Palm Beach. There were some people who lived on board all the time, having special tracks built for them in pleasant locations wherever they stopped. One man had built a huge automobile railroad car shaped like a ram, and having accommodation for sixty people. The Prentice train had four cars, one of them a library car finished in St. Igo Mahogany, and provided with a pipe organ. Also there were bathrooms and a barber shop, and a baggage car with two autos on board for exploring purposes. Since the episode of Mrs. Winnie, Oliver had apparently concluded that his brother was one of the initiated. Not long afterward he permitted him to a glimpse into that side of his life which had been hinted at in the songs at the bachelor's dinner. Oliver had planned to take Betty Wyman to the theater, but Betty's grandfather had come home from the West unexpectedly, and so Oliver came round and took his brother instead. I was going to play a joke on her, he said. We'll go to see one of my old flames. It was a translation of a French farce in which the marital infidelities of two young couples were the occasion of many mishaps. One of the characters was a waiting maid, who was in love with a handsome young soldier, and was pursued by the husband of one of the couples. It was a minor part, but the young Jewish girl who played it had so many pretty graces and such a merry laugh that she made it quite conspicuous. When the act was over, Oliver asked him whose acting he liked best, and he named her. Come and be introduced to her, Oliver said. He opened the door near their box. How do you do, Mr. Wilson, he said, nodding to a man in evening dress, who stood nearby. Then he turned towards the dressing rooms, and went down a corridor, and knocked upon one of the doors. A voice called, Come in, and he opened the door, and there was a tiny room, with odds and ends of clothing scattered about, and the girl clad in corsets and underskirt, seating before a mirror. "'Hello, Rosalie,' said he. And she dropped her powder-puff and sprang up with a cry, "'Ollie!' In a moment more she had her arms about his neck. "'Oh, you wretched man!' she cried. "'Why don't you come to see me any more? Didn't you get my letters?' "'I got some,' said he, "'but I've been busy. This is my brother, Mr. Allan Montague.' The other nodded to Montague and said, How do you do? But without letting go of Oliver. 
why don't you come to see me she exclaimed there there now said oliver laughing good-naturedly i brought my brother along so that you'd have to behave yourself i don't care about your brother exclaimed the girl without even giving him another glance then she held oliver at arm's length and gazed into his face how can you be so cruel to me she asked i told you i was busy he said cheerfully and i gave you fair warning didn't i how's tootles oh tootles is in rapture said rosalie she's got a new fellow and then her manner changing to one of merriment she added oh ollie he gave her a diamond brooch and she looks like a countess she's hoping for a chance to wear it in a part you've seen tootles said oliver to his brother she's in the caliph of kamchatka they're going on the road next week said rosalie and then i'll be all alone she added in a pleading voice do ollie be a good boy and take us out tonight think how long it's been since i've seen you why i've been so good i don't know myself in the looking-glass please ollie all right said he maybe i will i'm not going to let you get away from me she cried i'll come right over the footlights after you you'd better get dressed said oliver you'll be late he pushed aside a tray with some glasses on it and seated himself upon a trunk and montague stood in a corner and watched rosalie while she powdered and painted herself and put on an airy summer dress and poured out a flood of gossip about tootles and flossie and grace and some others a few minutes later came a stentorian voice in the hallway second act there were more embraces and then ollie brushed the powder from his coat and went away laughing montague stood for a few moments in the wings watching the scene shifters putting the final touches on the new set and the various characters taking their positions then they went out to their seats is it see a jewel asked oliver she's very pretty the other admitted she came right out of the slum said oliver over on rivington street that don't happen very often how did you come to know her asked his brother oh i picked her out she was in a chorus then i got her first speaking part did you said the other in surprise how did you do that oh a little money was the reply money will do most anything and i was in love with her that's how i got her montague said nothing but sat in thought we'll take her out to supper and make her happy added oliver as the curtains started up she's lonesome i guess you see i promised betty i'd reform all through that scene and the next one rosalie acted for them she was so full of verve and merriment that there was quite a stir in the audience and she got several rounds of applause then when the play was over she extricated herself from the arms of the handsome young soldier and fled to her dressing room and when oliver and montague arrived she was half ready for the street they went up broadway and from a group of people coming out of another stage entrance a young girl came to join them an airy little creature with the face of a doll baby and a big hat with a purple feather on top this was tootles otherwise known as helen gwynne and she took montague's arm and they fell in behind oliver and his companion montague wondered what one said to a chorus girl on the way to supper afterward his brother told him that tootles had been the wife of a real estate agent in a little town in oklahoma and had run away from respectability and boredom with a traveling theatrical company now she was tripping her part in the musical comedy which montague had seen at mrs lane's and incidentally swearing devotion to a handsome young wine agent she confided to montague that she hoped the latter might see her that evening he needed to be made jealous the great white way was the name which people had given to this part of broadway and at the head of it stood a huge hotel with flaming lights and gorgeous marble and bronze and famous paintings upon the walls and ceilings inside at this hour every one of its many dining-rooms was thronged 
with supper parties, and the place rang with laughter and the rattle of dishes and the strains of several orchestras which toiled heroically in the midst of the uproar. Here they found a table, and while Ollie was ordering frozen poached eggs and quails in aspic, Montague sat and gazed about him at the revelry and listened to the prattle of the little eccentress from Riverton Street. His brother had got her, he said, by buying a speaking part in a play for her, and Montague recalled the orgies of which he had heard at the bachelor's dinner, and divined that here he was at the source of the stream from which they were fed. At the table next to them was a young Hebrew, whom Tootles pointed out as the son and heir of a great clothing manufacturer. He was keeping several girls, said she, and the queenly creature who was his vis-a-vis -vis was one of the chorus in the maids of Mandalay. And a little way further down the room was a boy with the face of an angel and the air of a prince of the blood. He had inherited a million and run away from school, and was making a name for himself in the tenderloin. The pretty little girl, all in green, who was with him, was Violet Payne, who was the artist's model in a new play that had made a hit. She had had a full-page picture of herself in the Sunday supplement of the sporting paper, which was read here, so Rosalie remarked. "'Why don't you ever do that for me?' she added to Oliver. "'Perhaps I will,' said he, with a laugh. "'What does it cost?' And when he learned that the honor could be purchased for only fifteen hundred dollars, he said, "'I'll do it, if you'll be good.' And from that time on, the last trace of worriment vanished from the face and conversation of Rosalie. As the champagne cocktails disappeared, she and Oliver became confidential. Then Montague turned to Tootles to learn more about how the second generation was preying upon the women of the stage. A chorus girl got from ten to twenty dollars a week, said Tootles, and that was hardly enough to pay for her clothes. Her work was very uncertain. She would spend weeks at rehearsals, and then, if the play failed, she would get nothing. It was a dog's life, and the keys of freedom and opportunity were in the keeping of rich men, who haunted the theaters and laid siege to the girls. They would send in notes to them, or fling bouquets to them, with cards or perhaps money hidden in them. There were millionaire artists and bohemians who kept a standing order for seats in the front rows at opening performances. They had accounts with florists and liverymen and confectioners, and gave carte blanche to scores of girls who lent themselves to their purposes. Sometimes they were in league with the managers, and a girl who held back would find her chances imperiled. Sometimes these men would even finance shows to give a chance to some favorite. Afterward, Tools turned to listen to Oliver and his companion, and Montague sat back and gazed about the room. Next to him was a long table with a dozen people at it, and he watched the buckets of champagne and the endless succession of fantastic-looking dishes of food, and the revelers with their flushed faces and feverish eyes and loud laughter. Above all the tumult, was the voice of the orchestra, calling, calling, like the storm wind upon the mountains. The music was wild and chaotic, and produced an indescribable sense of pain and confusion. When one realized that the same thing was going on in thousands of places in this district, it seemed that here was a flood of dissipation that outrivaled even that of society. It was said that the hotels of New York, placed end to end, would reach all the way to London, and they took care of a couple of hundred thousand people a day, a horde which had come from all over the world in search of pleasure and excitement. There were sightseers and country customers, from forty-five states, ranchers from Texas, and lumber kings from Maine, and mining men from Nevada. At home they had reputations, and perhaps families to consider.' 
but once plunged into the whirlpool of the tenderloin, they were hidden from all the world. They came with their pockets full of money, and hotels and restaurants, gambling places and pool rooms and brothels, all were lying in wait for them. So eager had the competition become that there was a tailoring establishment and a bank that were never closed the year round except on Sunday. Everywhere about one's feet the nets of vice were spread. The head waiter in one's hotel was a steerer for a dive, and the house detective was touting for a gambling place. The handsome women who smiled at one in Peacock Alley was a madam. The pleasant-faced young man who spoke to one at the bar was on the lookout for customers for a brokerage house next door. Three times in a single day in another one of these great canavasories, Montague was offered short change, and so his eyes were opened to a new kind of plundering. He was struck by the number of attendants in livery who swarmed about him, and to whom he gave tips for their services. He did not notice that the boys in the washrooms and coat rooms could not speak a word of English. He could not know that they were searched every night, and had everything taken from them, and that the Greek who hired them had paid fifteen thousand dollars a year to the hotel for the privilege. So far had the specialization in evil proceeded, that there were places of prostitution which did a telephone business exclusively, and would send a woman in a cab to any address. And there were high-class assignation houses which furnished exquisite apartments and the services of maids and valets. And in this world of vice, the modern doctrine of the equality of the sexes was fully recognized. There were gambling houses and pool rooms and opium joints for women, and drinking places which catered especially for them. In the orange room of one of the big hotels, you might see rich women of every rank and type, fingering the dainty leather-bound and gold-embossed wine cards. In this room alone were sold over ten thousand drinks every day, and the hotel paid a rental of a million a year to the Devon estate. Not far away the Devons also owned the Negro Dives, where in the early hours of the morning you might see richly gowned white women drinking. In the seething cauldron of graft there were many strange ways of making money, and many strange and incredible types of human beings to be met. Once in society, Montague had pointed out to him a woman who had been a tattooed lady in a circus. There was another who had been a confederate of gamblers upon the ocean steamships, and another who had washed dishes in a mining camp. There was one of these great hotels whose proprietor had been a successful burglar, and a department store whose owner had begun life as a fence. In any crowd of these revelers, you might have such strange creatures pointed out to you. A multimillionaire who sold rotten jam to the people. Another who had invented opium, soothing syrup for babies. A convivial old gentleman who dispersed the yellow dog fund of several railroads. A handsome chauffeur who had run away with an heiress. Once a great scientist had invented a new kind of underwear, and had endeavored to make it a gift to humanity. And here was a man who had seized upon it and made millions out of it. Here was a trance medium, who had got a fortune out of an imbecile old manufacturer. And here was a great newspaper proprietor, who published advertisements for assignations at a dollar a line. And here was a cigar manufacturer, whose smug face was upon every billboard. He had begun as a tin manufacturer, and to avoid the duty, he had had his raw materials cast in the form of statues and brought them in as works of art. And terrible and vile, as were the sources from which these fortunes had been derived, there were no viler nor more terrible than the purposes for which they had been spent. Mrs. Vivie Patton had hinted to Montague of a Decameron Club, whose members gathered in each other's homes and vied in the telling of obscene stories. Strathcona had told him about another set of exquisite ladies and gentlemen who gave elaborate entertainments 
in which they dressed in the costumes of bygone periods and imitated famous characters in history and the vices and orgies of courts and camps one heard of cleopatra nights on board of yachts at newport there was a certain wall street plunger who had begun life as a mining man in the west and when his customers came in town he would hire a trolley car and take a load of champagne and a half a dozen prostitutes and spend the night careening about the country this man was now quartered in one of the great hotels in new york and in his apartments he would have prize fights and chicken fights and bloodthirsty exhibitions called purring matches in which men tried to bark each other's shins or perhaps a battle royal with a diamond scarf pin dangling from the ceiling and half a dozen negroes in a free-for-all fight for the prize no picture of the ways of the metropolis would be complete which did not force upon the reluctant reader some realization of the extent to which new and hideous incitements to vice were spreading to say that among the leisured classes such practices were raging like a pestilence would be no exaggeration ten years ago they were regarded with aversion by even the professionally vicious but now the commonest prostitute accepted them as part of her fate and there was no height to which they had not reached ministers of state were enslaved by them great fortunes and public events were controlled by them in washington there had been an ambassador whose natural daughter taught them in the houses of the great until the scandal forced the minister's recall some of these practices were terrible in their effects completely wrecking the victim in a short time and physicians who studied their symptoms would be horrified to see them appearing in the homes of their friends and from new york the center of the wealth and culture of the country these vices spread to every corner of it theatrical companies and traveling salesmen carried them visiting merchants and sightseers acquired them pack peddlers sold vile pictures and books the manufacturing or importing of which was now quite an industry one might read catalogues printed abroad in english the contents of which would make one's flesh creep there were cheap weeklies costing ten cents a year which were thrust into area windows for servant girls there were yellow covered french novels of unbelievable depravity for the mistress of the house it was a curious commentary upon the morals of society that upon the trains running to a certain suburban community frequented by the ultra-fashionable the newsboys did a thriving business in such literature and when the pastor of a fashionable church eloped with a society girl the bishop publicly laid blame to the morals of his parishioners the theory was that there were two worlds and that they were kept rigidly separate there were two sets of women one to be toyed with and flung aside and the other to be protected and esteemed such things as prostitutes and kept women might exist but people of refinement did not talk about them and were not concerned with them but montague was familiar with the saying that if you follow the chain of the slave you will find the other end about the wrist of the master and he discovered that the tenderloin was wrecking its vengeance upon fifth avenue it was not merely that the men of wealth were carrying to their wives and children the diseases of vice they were carrying also the manners and the ideals montague had been amazed by the things he had found in new york society the smoking and drinking and gambling of women their hard and cynical views of life their continual telling of coarse stories and here in this underworld he had come upon the fountainhead of the corruption it was something which came to him in a sudden flash of intuition the barriers between the two worlds were breaking down he could picture the process in a hundred different forms there was betty wyman his brother had meant to take her to the theatre to let her see rosalie by way of a joke so of course betty knew of his escapades and of those of his set 
she and her girlfriends were whispering and jesting about them. Here sat Oliver, smiling and cynical, toying with Rosalie as a cat might toy with a mouse. And tomorrow he would be with Betty. And could anyone doubt any longer whence Betty had derived her attitudes toward life? And the habits of mind that Oliver had taught her as a girl, she would not forget as a wife. He might be anxious to keep her to himself, but there would be others whose interests was different. And Montague recalled other things that he had seen or heard in society, that he could put his finger upon as having come out of this underworld. The more he thought of the explanation, the more it seemed to explain. This society, which had perplexed him, now he could describe. Its manners and ideals of life were those which he would have expected to find in the fast side of stage life. It was, of course, the women who made society and gave it its tone. The women of society were actresses. They were actresses in their love of notoriety and display, in their taste in clothes and jewels, in their fondness for cigarettes and champagne. They made up like actresses. They talked and thought like actresses. The only obvious difference was that the women of the stage were carefully selected and were at least up to a certain standard of physical excellence, whereas the women of society were not selected at all, and some were lean, and some were stout, and some were painfully homely. Montague recalled cases where the two sets had met at some of the private entertainments. It was getting to be the fashion to hobnob with the stage people on such occasions, and he recalled how naturally the younger people took to this. Only the older women held aloof, looking down upon the women of the stage from an ineffable height as belonging to a lower caste, because they were obliged to work for their living. But it seemed to Montague, as he sat and talked with his poor chorus girl, who had sold herself for a little pleasure, that it was easier to pardon her than the woman who had been born to luxury and scorned those who produced her wealth. But most of all, one's sympathies went out to a person who was not to be met in either of these sets, the girl who had not sold herself, but was struggling for a living in the midst of this ravening corruption. There were thousands of self-respecting women, even on the stage. Toodles herself had been among them, she told Montague. I kept straight for a long time, she said, laughing cheerfully, and on ten dollars a week. I used to go out on the road, and they paid me sixteen, and think of trying to live on one-night stands, to board yourself and stop at hotels and dress for the theater, on sixteen a week, and no job half the year. And all that time, do you know Cyril Chambers, the famous church painter? I've heard of him, said Montague. Well, I was with a show here on Broadway the next winter, and every night for six months he sent me a bunch of orchids that couldn't have cost less than seventy-five dollars. And he told me he had opened an account for me in all the stores I chose, if I'd spend next summer in Europe with him. He said I could take my mother or my sister with me, and I was so green in those days I thought that that must mean he didn't intend anything wrong. Toodles smiled at the memory. Did you go? asked the man. No, she answered. I stayed here with a roof garden show that failed, and I went to my old manager for a job, and he said to me, I can only pay you ten a week, but why are you so foolish? How do you mean? I asked, and he answered, Why don't you get a rich sweetheart? Then I could pay you sixty. That's what a girl hears on the stage. I don't understand, said Montague, perplexed. Did he mean he could get money out of the man? Not directly, said Toodles, but tickets and advertising. Why, men will hire front row seats for a whole season if they're interested in a girl in the show. And they'll take all their friends to see her, and she'll be talked about, and she'll be somebody instead of just nobody as I was. Then it actually helps her on the stage, said Montague. Helps her, exclaimed Toodles. My God! I've known a girl who's been abroad with a tip-top swell, 
and had the gowns and the jewels to prove it. To come home and get into the front row of a chorus at a hundred dollars a week. Toodles was cheerful and all unaware, and that only made the tragedy of it all one shade more black to Montague. He sat lost in somber reverie, forgetting his companions and the blare and glare of the place. In the center of this dining room was a great cone-shaped stand containing a display of food, and as they strolled out, Montague stopped to look at it. There were platters garnished with flowers and herbs, and containing roast turkeys and baked hams, jellied meats and game in aspect, puddings and tarts and frosted cakes, every kind of food fantastically imaginable. One might have spent an hour in studying it, and from top to bottom he would have found nothing simple, nothing natural. The turkeys had paper curls and rosettes stuck over them. The hams were covered with a white gelatin, the deviled crabs with a yellow mayonnaise, and all were painted over in pink and green and black with landscapes and marine views, with ships and shoes and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. The jellied meats and the puddings were in the shape of fruits and flowers, and there were elaborate works of art in pink and white confectionery, a barnyard, for instance, with horses and cows, and a pump, and a dairy maid, and one or two alligators. All this was changed every day. Every morning you might see a procession of a score of waiters bearing aloft a new supply. Montague remembered Betty Wynne's remark at their first interview, apropos of the whipped cream made into little curlicues, and how his brother had said, if Alan were here, he'd be thinking about the man who fixed that cream, and how long it took him, and how he might have been reading The Simple Life. He thought of that now. He stood and gazed and wondered about all the slaves of the lamp who served in this huge temple of luxury. He looked at the waiters, pale, hollow-chested, harried-looking men. He imagined the hordes of servants of yet lower kinds, who never emerged into the light of day, the men who washed the dishes, the men who carried the garbage, the men who shoveled the coal into the furnaces, and made the heat and light and power, pent up in dim cellars, many stories underground, and bound forever to the service of sensuality. How terrible must be their fate, how unimaginable their corruption. And they were foreigners, they had come here seeking liberty, and the masters of the new country had seized them and pent them here. From this as a starting point, his thought went on, to the hordes of toilers in every part of the world, whose fate it was to create the things which these blind revelers destroyed, the women and children in countless mills and sweatshops, who spun the cloth and cut and sewed it, the girls who made the artificial flowers, who rolled the cigarettes, and who gathered the grapes from the vines, the miners who dug the coal and the precious metals out of the earth, the men who watched in ten thousand signal towers and engines, who fought the elements from the decks of ten thousand ships, to bring all these things here to be destroyed. Step by step, as the flood of extravagance rose, and the energies of the men were turned to the creation of futility and corruption. So step by step increased the misery and degradation of all these slaves of mammon. And who could imagine what they would think about if ever they came to think? And then in a sudden flash there came back to Montague that speech he had heard upon the street corner the first evening he had been in New York. He could hear again the pounding of the elevated trains, and the shrill voice of the orator. He could see his haggard and hungry face, and the dense crowd gazing up at him. And there came to him the words of Major Thorne. It means another civil war. End of chapter 20《Chapter 21 of the Metropolis by Upton Sinclair》
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Alice had been gone for a couple of weeks, and the day was drawing near when the Hasbrook case came up for trial. The Saturday before that, being the date of the Meek Karma dance at the Long Island Hot Club, Siegfried Harvey was to have a house party for the weekend, and Montague accepted his invitation. He had been working hard, putting the finishing touches to his brief, and he thought that a rest would be good for him. He and his brother went down upon Friday afternoon, and the first person he met was Betty Wyman, who he had not seen for quite a while. Betty had much to say and said it. As Montague had not been seen with Mrs. Winnie since the episode in her house, people had begun to notice the break, and there was no end of gossip, and Mistress Betty wanted to know all about it, and how things stood between them. But he would not tell her, and so she saucily refused to tell him what she had heard. All the while they talked, she was eyeing him quizzically, and it was evident that she took the worst for granted. Also, that he had become a much more interesting person to her because of it. Montague had the strangest sensations when he was talking with Betty Wyman. She was delicious and appealing, almost irresistible, and yet her views of life were so old. I told you you wouldn't do for a tame cat, she said to him. Then she went on to talk to him about his case and to tease him about the disturbance he had made. You know, she said, Ollie and I were in a terror. We thought that Grandfather would be furious, and that we'd be ruined. But somehow it didn't work out that way. Don't you say anything about it, but I've had sort of a fancy that he must be on your side of the fence. I'm glad to know it, said Montague, with a laugh. I've been trying for a long time to find out who is on my side of the fence. He was talking about it the other day, said Betty, and I heard him tell a man that he had read your argument, and thought it was good. I'm glad to hear that, said Montague. So was I, replied she, and I said to him afterward, I suppose you don't know that Alan Montague is my Ollie's brother, and he did you the honor to say that he hadn't supposed any member of Ollie's family could have as much sense. Betty was staying with Aunt nearby, and she went back before dinner. In the automobile which came for her was old Wyman himself, on his way home from the city, and as a snowstorm had begun, he came in and stood by the fire while his car was exchanged for a closed one from Harvey's stables. Montague did not meet him, but stood and watched him from the shadows, a mite of a man with a keen and eager face full of wrinkles. It was hard to realize that this little body held one of the great driving minds of the country. He was an intensely nervous and irritable man, bitter and implacable, by all odds the most hated and feared man in Wall Street. He was swift, imperious, savage as a hornet. Directors at meetings that I attend vote first and discuss afterwards, was one of his sayings, that Montague had heard quoted. Watching him here by the fireside, rubbing his hands, and chatting pleasantly, Montague had a sudden sense of being behind the scenes, of being admitted to a privilege denied to ordinary mortals, the beholding of royalty in everyday attire. After dinner that evening, Montague had a chat in the smoking room with his host, and he brought up the subject of the Hasbrook case, and told about his trip to Washington and his interview with Judge Ellis. Harvey also had something to communicate. I had a talk with Freddy Van Dam about it, said he. What did he say? asked Montague. Well, replied the other with a laugh, he's indignant. Needless to say, you know, Freddy was brought up by his father to regard the fidelity as his property, in a way. He always refers to it as my company, and he's very high and mighty about it. It's a personal affront if anyone attacks it. But it was evident to me that he doesn't know who's behind this case. Did he know about Ellis? asked Montague. Yes, said the other. He had found out that much. It was he who told me that originally. He says that Ellis has been sponging off the company for years. 
He has a big salary that he never earns and has borrowed something like a quarter of a million dollars on worthless securities. Montague gave a gasp. Yes, laughed Harvey, but after all, that's a little matter. The trouble with Freddy Van Dam is that sort of thing is all he sees, and so he'll never be able to make out the mystery. He knows that this clique or that in the company is plotting to get some advantage, or to use him for their purposes. But he never realizes how the big men are pulling the wires behind the scenes. Some day they'll throw him overboard altogether. And then he'll realize how they've played with him. That's what this Hasbrook case means, you know. They simply want to frighten him with a threat of getting the company's affairs into the courts and the newspapers. Montague sat for a while in deep thought. What would you think would be Wyman's relation to the matter? he asked at last. I wouldn't know, said Harvey. He's supposed to be Freddy's backer. But what can you tell in such a tangle? It is certainly a mess, said Montague. There's no bottom to it, said the other. Absolutely. It would take your breath away. Just listen to what Van Dam told me today. And then Harvey named one of the directors of the Fidelity, who was well known as a philanthropist. Having heard that the wife of one of his junior partners had met with an accident in childbirth, and that the doctor had told her husband that if she ever had another child she would die, this man asked, Why don't you have her life insured? The other replied that he had tried, and the companies had refused her. I'll fix it for you, said he, and so they put in another application, and the director came to Freddy Van Dam and had the policy put through by executive order. Seven months later the woman died, and Fidelity had paid her husband in full, a hundred thousand or two. That's what's going on in the insurance world, said Siegfried Harvey. And that was the story which Montague took with him to add to the enjoyment of the festivities at the country club. It was a very gorgeous affair, but perhaps the somberness of his thoughts was to blame. The flowers and music and beautiful gowns failed entirely in their appeal, and he saw only the gluttony and drunkenness, more of it than ever before, it seemed to him. Then, too, he had an unpleasant experience. He met Laura Hagen, and presuming upon her cordial reception of his visit, he went up and spoke to her pleasantly, and she greeted him with frigid politeness. She was so brief in her remarks and turned away so abruptly as almost to snub him. He went away quite bewildered, but later on he recalled the gossip about himself and Mrs. Winnie, and he guessed that that was the explanation of Miss Hagen's action. The episode threw a shadow over his whole visit. On Sunday he went out into the country and tramped through a snowstorm by himself, filled with a sense of disgust for all the past and of foreboding for the future. He hated this money world, in which all that was worse than human beings was brought to the surface. He hated it and wished he had never set foot within its bounds. It was only by tramping until he was too tired to feel anything that he was able to master himself. And then toward dark he came back and found a telegram which had been forwarded from New York. Meet me at the Penna Depot, Jersey City, at nine tonight, Alice. This message, of course, drove all other thoughts from his mind. He had no time even to tell Oliver about it. He had to jump into an automobile and rush to catch the next train for the city. And all through the long, cold ride in ferry boats and cabs, he pondered this mystery. Alice's party had not been expected for two weeks yet, and only two days before they had come a letter from Los Angeles saying that they would probably be a week overtime, and here she was home again. He found there was an express from the West due at the hour named. Apparently, therefore, Alice had not come in the Prentice's train at all. The express was half an hour late, and so he paced up and down the platform, controlling his impatience as best he could, and finally the long train pulled in, and he saw Alice coming down the platform. She was alone. "'What does it mean?' were the first words he said to her. "'It's a long story,' she answered. 
I wanted to come home. You mean you've come all the way from the coast by yourself, he gasped. Yes, she said, all the way. What in the world, he began. I can't tell you here, Alan, she said. Wait till we get to some quiet place. But, he persisted, the Prentice, they let you come home alone? They didn't know it, she said. I ran away. He was more bewildered than ever. But as he started to ask more questions, she laid a hand upon his arm. Please wait, Alan, she said. It upsets me to talk about it. It was Charlie Carter. And so the light broke. He caught his breath and gasped. Oh! He said not another word until they had crossed the ferry and settled themselves in a cab and started. Now, he said, tell me. Alice began. I was very much upset, she said. But you must understand, Alan, that I've had nearly a week to think it over, and I don't mind it now. So I want you please not to get excited about it. It wasn't poor Charlie's fault. He can't help himself. It was my mistake. I ought to have taken your advice and had nothing to do with him. Go on, said he, and Alice told her story. The party had gone sightseeing, and she had had a headache and stayed in the car, and Charlie Carter had come and begun to make love to her. He had asked me to marry him already. That was at the beginning of the trip, she said, and I told him no. After that, he would never let me alone. And this time he went on in a terrible way. He flung himself down on his knees and wept and said he couldn't live without me. And nothing I could say did any good. At last he, he caught hold of me. And he wouldn't let me go. I was furious with him and frightened. I had to threaten to call for help before he would stop. And so you see how it was. I see, said Montague gravely. Go on. Well, after that I made up my mind that I couldn't stay anywhere where I had to see him. And I knew he would never go away without a scene. If I had asked Mrs. Prentice to send him away, there would have been a scandal, and it would have spoiled everybody's trip. So I went out and found there was a train for the East in a little while, and I packed up my things and left a note for Mrs. Prentice. I told her a story. I said, I'd had a telegram that your mother was ill, and that I didn't want to spoil their good time, and had gone by myself. That was the best thing I could think of. I wasn't afraid to travel, so long as I was sure that Charlie couldn't catch up with me. Montague said nothing. He sat with his hands gripped tightly. It seemed like a desperate thing to do, said Alice nervously, but you see, I was upset and unhappy. I didn't seem to like the party any more. I wanted to be home. Do you understand? Yes, said Montague, I understand, and I'm glad you are here. They reached home, and Montague called up Harvey's and told his brother what had happened. He could hear Oliver gasp with astonishment. That's a pretty how-do-you-do, he said, when he had got his breath back, and then he added with a laugh, I suppose that settles poor Charlie's chances. I'm glad you've come to that conclusion, said the other, as he hung up the receiver. This episode gave Montague quite a shock, but he had little time to think about it. The next morning at eleven o'clock his case was to come up for trial, and so all his thoughts were called away. This case had been the one real interest of his life for the last three months. It was his purpose, the thing for the sake of which he endured everything else that repelled him. And he had trained himself as an athlete for a great race. He was in form and ready for the effort of his life. He went downtown that morning with every fiber of him, body and mind, alert and eager. And he went into his office, and in his mail was a letter from Mr. Hasbrook. He opened it hastily and read a message, brief, direct, and decisive as a sword thrust. I beg to inform you that I have received a satisfactory proposition from the Fidelity Company. I have settled with them and wish to withdraw the suit. Thanking you for your services, I remain sincerely. To Montague, this thing came like a thunderbolt. He sat utterly dumbfounded. His hands went limp 
and the letter fell upon the desk in front of him. And at last, when he did move, he picked up the telephone and told his secretary to call up Mr. Hasbrook. Then he sat waiting, and when the bell rang, picked up the receiver, expecting to hear Mr. Hasbrook's voice and to demand an explanation. But he heard instead the voice of his own secretary. Central says the number's been discontinued, sir. And he hung up the receiver and sat motionless again. The dummy had disappeared. To Montague this incident meant a change in the prospects of his whole life. It was the collapse of all his hopes. He had nothing more to work for, nothing more to think about. The bottom had fallen out of his career. He was burning with a sense of outrage. He had been tricked and made a fool of. He had been used and flung aside. And now there was nothing he could do. He was utterly helpless. What affected him most was a sense of the overwhelming magnitude of the powers which had made him their puppet, of the utter futility of the efforts that he or any other man could make against them. They were like elemental, cosmic forces. They held all the world in their grip, and a common man was as much at their mercy as a bit of chaff in a tempest. All day long he sat in his office, brooding and nursing his wrath. He had moods when he wished to drop everything, to shake the dust of the city from his feet and go back home and recollect what it was to be a gentleman. And then again he had fighting moods when he wished to devote all his life to punishing the men who had made use of him. He would get hold of some other policyholder in the fidelity, one whom he could trust. He would take the case without pay and carry it through to the end. He would force the newspapers to talk about it. He would force the people to heed what he said. And then, towards evening, he went home, bitter and sore, and there was his brother sitting in his study, waiting for him. Hello, he said, and took off his coat, preparing his mind for one more ignominy, the telling of his misfortune to Oliver, and listening to his inevitable, I told you so. But Oliver himself had something to communicate, something that would not bear keeping. He broke out at once. Tell me, Alan, what in the world has happened between you and Mrs. Winnie? What do you mean? asked Montague sharply. Why, said Oliver, everybody is talking about some kind of quarrel. There's been no quarrel, said Montague. Well, what is it, then? It's nothing. It must be something, exclaimed Oliver. What do all the stories mean? What stories? About you two. I met Mrs. Vivy Patton just now, and she swore me to secrecy and told me that Mrs. Winnie had told someone that you had made love to her so outrageously that she had to ask you to leave the house. Montague shrunk as from a blow. Oh, he gasped. That's what she said, said he. It's a lie, he cried. That's what I told Mrs. Vivy, said the other. It doesn't sound like you. Montague had flushed scarlet. I don't mean that, he cried. I mean that Mrs. Winnie never said any such thing. Oh, said Oliver, and he shrugged his shoulders. Maybe not, he added. But I know she's furious with you about something. Everybody's talking about it. She tells people that she'll never speak to you again. And what I want to know is, why is it? that you have to do things to make enemies of everybody you know. Montague said nothing. He was trembling with anger. What in the world did you do to her? began the other. Can't you trust me? And suddenly Montague sprang to his feet. Oh, Oliver, he exclaimed, let me alone. Go away. And he went into the next room and slammed the door and began pacing back and forth like a caged animal. It was a lie. It was a lie. Mrs. Winnie had never said such a thing. He would never believe it. It was a nasty piece of backstairs gossip. But then a new burst of rage swept over him. What did it matter, whether it was true or not, whether anything was true or not? What did it matter if anybody had done all the hideous and loathsome things that everybody else said they had done? It was what everybody was saying. It was what everybody believed. 
what everybody was interested in. It was the measure of a whole society, their ideas and their standards. It was the way they spent their time, repeating nasty scandals about each other, living in an atmosphere of suspicion and cynicism, an endless whispering and leering and gossiping of lewd intrigue. A flood of rage surged up within him and swept him away, rage against the world into which he had come and against himself for the part he had played in it. Everything seemed to have come to a head at once. He hated everything, hated the people he had met and the things they did and the things they had tempted him to do. He hated the way he had got his money and the way he had spent it. He hated the idleness and wastefulness and drunkenness and debauchery, the meanness and the snobbishness. And suddenly he turned and flung open the door of the room where Oliver still sat. And he stood in the doorway exclaiming, Oliver, I'm done with it. Oliver stared at him. What do you mean? he asked. I mean, cried his brother, that I've had all I can stand of society, and I'm going to quit. You can go on, but I don't intend to take another step with you. I've had enough, and I think Alice has had enough also. We'll take ourselves off your hands. We'll get out. What are you going to do? gasped Oliver. I'm going to give up these expensive apartments. Give them up tomorrow when our week is up. And I'm going to stop squandering money for things I don't want. And I'm going to stop accepting invitations and meeting people I don't like and don't want to know. I've tried your game. I've tried it hard. And I don't like it. And I'm going to get out before it's too late. I'm going to find some decent and simple place to live in. And I'm going downtown to find out if there isn't some way in New York for a man to earn an honest living. End of chapter 21 End of The Metropolis by Upton Sinclair Recording by Richard Kilmer, San Antonio, Texas